Lately, I've been thinking about upgrading my Chase Sapphire Preferred to the Chase Sapphire Reserve, but that would also mean paying an annual fee of $550. That's a high price to pay, but it might be worth it for me. So I'll give you my seven reasons why I want the Chase Sapphire Reserve. And instead of scrolling through the Chase website, listing off the perks and benefits of each card, the Preferred and the Reserve, instead I will tell you about my unique travel experiences and how I plan to use the Chase Sapphire Reserve to hopefully save a lot of money on travel around the world. So let's get started with reason number one, and that is I travel a lot, not just because I enjoy it, and I absolutely do, but also because of my other YouTube channel. My wife and I travel the world, and then we just film our experiences, and because of the success over there, it makes us want to travel even more, and so that means three things. Number one, we need flights and we need hotels. Number two, we want to spend less money on travel to keep more dollars in our pocket. And then number three, I need a credit card that is gonna give us positive value for holding it. So if we spend $550 on this annual fee for the Chase Sapphire Reserve, I wanna make sure that we're getting at least $550 worth of value from holding it before we have to pay the $550 annual fee again. So with that said, we can keep going. And point number two is that the Sapphire Reserve is a decent card. Some ways this card can help me get positive value from it is the $300 travel credit. This is extremely easy to use on so many different purchases. And so I can value this at the full $300 as I'm going to be using this card for travel anyway. And so that $550 annual fee quickly becomes $250. Another thing I like about this Sapphire Reserve is that it does have a 50% boost through the Chase Travel portal so you can get 1.5 cents per point every time you make a redemption through the travel portal so whether that's flights or hotels or anything else you can find there i used to value this at zero dollars actually because i thought that what is the point of getting 1.5 cents per point through the portal but now I'm starting to think about it differently and we'll definitely come back to this perk later on in the video. There's also priority pass that you get with this card and access to priority pass restaurants, which I do not have with any other card that I own. Also, there's Lyft Pink membership. You can get it for two years with the Sapphire Reserve. There's also other perks and benefits of this card that can be good for a lot of people, but just for the sake of this video and to kind of stack the deck against me when it comes to making sure I get positive value out of the Sapphire Reserve, I will value every perk and benefit at zero dollars for this card, just to make it simple. Something else that I am going to include in this calculation of the effective annual fee for the Sapphire Reserve is going to be the fact that I would hold the Sapphire Preferred card if I wouldn't get the Sapphire Reserve. I've already said that I am definitely going to hold on to this card. It is going to give me positive value. I said that in a past video on my channel if you want to check it out. So if I already said that the $95 annual fee is going to be worth it for me to hold on to the Sapphire Preferred. And it does have a $50 hotel credit that for the sake of this video, I will value it at the full $50. That means I was willing to pay at least $45 for the access to Chase's transfer partners. So that means that I can deduct that from the $250 effective annual fee that we have for the Sapphire Reserve. And now we're down to $205. So now I just have to figure out if the 50% boost in the Chase Travel Portal is worth $205. Well, We'll definitely talk about that, but right now, let's get on to point number three, and that is I don't want luxury with my travels. When I travel, I want the best value for my money or for my points, not necessarily the best hotel or the best experience. This thinking will definitely be different depending on the type of person you are and the type of experiences you wanna have when traveling. Let's say you only have two to three weeks every year of paid time off from your nine to five 
five job and you want to make the most use of that time, well, it would totally make sense to spend a ton of points at a really nice property. But for me, since I'm traveling so much, I need to spread out my credit card points to make sure that they last me throughout my entire travels. And so that means I'm staying at a lot of boutique hotels, ones that are not affiliated with any chain. And this is nice because I feel like I get a local experience this way and I don't have to spend credit card points when I'm paying cash for these cheaper hotels. Of course, I do want nicer experiences from time to time, but I've just found that when you go on booking.com and you book an affordable hotel room, that's kind of what I'm going for in my travels around the world. This point may make a little bit more sense once we get to talking about the Chase Travel Portal later on in the video. Point number four is that the cents per point calculation is overrated. It is a very nice metric to determine if you're getting good value from your credit card points. So you just take the cash price that you are paying and you divide that by the points price you are paying. And that typically gives you a calculation and you can see, am I getting a good value or a bad value? And I like calculating the cents per point. It is good to know that information, but this formula just does not tell the full story. I'd like to show you two examples that I've just come up with and it seems pretty accurate to what I have been experiencing around the world. Since Hyatt is a transfer partner of Chase and this is a Chase video, let's use them as an example. So let's say that you are able to find a category one Hyatt in the city that you want to travel to. This is going to cost you 5,000 Chase points per night to stay there on a typical day at that hotel. And that means if you do a three night stay, you are going to be spending 15,000 chase points to make this booking happen. So you're spending those 15,000 chase points for three nights. And if you want to book a different hotel in the same city, let's look at a $70 a night hotel, which is completely reasonable. If there's category one Hyatt's out there, there's probably gonna be a hotel for $70 a night. So if you book this one for the same three nights that you would have at the Hyatt hotel, then that is going to cost you $210 ten dollars for those three nights. If you were to book this hotel through the Chase Travel Portal with the Sapphire Reserve, this would run you 14,000 Chase points. Maybe in this example I would choose to stay at the Hyatt over the Boutique Hotel because it is only 1,000 points more and maybe those three nights can help you earn towards loyalty status and so maybe just book the Hyatt there. But what happens when there's not a category one Hyatt hotel that I could book? Let's say that the cheapest option is going to be a category three Hyatt. Well, this is going to cost you 12,000 points per night. And if you're staying the same three nights, that is going to cost you 36,000 chase points for three nights. Still, that's not too bad or anything like that, but let's say you can find a boutique hotel in the same city and we'll raise the price to $100 a night. So you're spending $300 for the three nights. Well, if you book it at 1.5 cents per point through the Chase Travel Portal, that is only going to cost you 20,000 Chase points for the same three nights. Now that's looking a lot better than spending 36,000 Chase points for three nights. Of course, you're not gonna earn any loyalty status with this one-off hotel in whatever city that you wanna travel to, but it is a good way to hold on to a lot more of your chase points. So even if the cents per point calculation of booking that Hyatt hotel is maybe two cents per point or three cents per point or even higher than that, you're still paying a lot more points for staying in the same city for the same amount of nights. That's one of the reasons why I think cents per point, the calculation is just a little bit overrated. And now moving on with the same theme, point number five is that I don't care about hotel loyalty programs. I originally thought that I would care a lot more about the loyalty programs. In fact, I mean, I'm staying over 100 nights in hotels throughout 2024. So you would think that maybe if I stayed 
60 nights at Hyatt Properties, I could earn the top tier status, or 70 nights at IHG Properties, I could earn their top tier status there. But the truth is I will never stay enough nights at any one hotel chain in order to earn their top tier status. I can hold on to certain credit cards like the American Express Platinum card that is going to give me Hilton Gold status and Marriott Gold status, or hold on to the IHG Premier credit card, and that is going to give me Platinum Elite status with IHG. But I will never stay enough nights to earn Hyatt Globalist or IHG Diamond Elite or any other top tier status without holding a credit card. This is largely due to two main factors. Number one is the price. It's just more expensive to stay at these chain hotels than other boutique hotels I might find on booking.com or anything else. And factor number two is that my wife and I like to stay off the beaten path whenever we get the opportunity. So whenever we go away from a major city, there might not be a Hyatt there, there might not be a Marriott, Hilton, IHG, Best Western, any of those options out there. And so it wouldn't make sense to try to go after 60 nights at Hyatt if I'm only staying in major cities, maybe 40 or 50 of those nights every single year. I hope I didn't make too many people upset right there, but that's just the truth for my situation and it could be completely different for your situation. And now on to point number six, and that is the American Express and Capital One travel portals provide me basically no value. This is an interesting point because this is a chase video, but just hear me out. I get one cent per point maximum when I redeem my points through the American Express travel portal and the Capital One travel portal. So this could be an interesting opportunity to maximize my points through a travel portal if I have the Sapphire Reserve and get 1.5 cents per point. How I see it right now is that I could use my American Express points and my Capital One miles to use to transfer out to international airline partners and book some really nice business class flights that way Way, or even some economy flights, and then I could just have a ton of chase points to use through the travel portal to book domestic flights that typically don't help me get more than 1.5 cents per point anyway, and also use those same chase points to book a ton of boutique hotels all around the world. Basically, what I'm trying to say is if I use my Amex points and my Capital One miles for some really, really good value for flights, I could be willing to take a hit from the value of my chase points because all of my credit card points should be working together to give me the best travel experiences possible with the lowest dollar amount coming out of my pocket. I definitely still don't like travel portals for a lot of reasons, but point number seven is directly tied to that, and that is the Chase Travel Portal is actually good? I mean, I have seen the Chase Travel Portal go through a couple different changes over the years, and originally, like, I used it a lot because that was the only thing I knew at the time when I first got started with credit cards, and then after I learned, oh, actually, this isn't really a good situation, I just pulled completely all the way back from using it, and now after looking at the American Express Travel Portal and also the Capital One Travel Portal, after getting approved for the Venture X, I've realized that the Chase Travel Portal seems to be way better than the other two. Even when I compare the Chase Travel Portal to other hotel sites like Hotels.com or Booking.com, I found the Chase Travel Portal to actually be extremely reasonable, which did not seem to be the case when I was looking at it like two years ago. So maybe something changed between then and now, but the Chase Travel Portal seems to be offering a very good price for a lot of hotels hotel redemptions. I am very familiar with these sites like Hotels.com and Booking.com because last year in 2023, I spent over $6,000 in hotels through Booking.com and I've been looking at travel in 2024 and the places that I want to go and I've compared the Booking.com price and the Chase Travel Portal price and they seem to be the exact same in a lot of instances. So this is everything that has crossed my mind over the past couple of months when it comes to keeping my Sapphire Preferred or maybe trying to upgrade it to the Sapphire Reserve. I'm not gonna pull the trigger right now. I need about a week or so to think about 
if this is the right decision for me, but it seems like I may have just convinced myself to get the Sapphire Reserve, but let me know in the comments what you guys think about these two cards. See which one you like more, the Sapphire Preferred or the Sapphire Reserve, and maybe that'll help me make my decision a little bit more clear. If you liked this video and are thinking about signing up for one of these two cards or any other credit cards for that matter, using the link in my description to sign up for a card is a huge way to help support the channel and so that I can make better videos for you in the future. And you may also be interested in this video where I determined that the Sapphire Preferred was worth it for me to hold after year one. So if you want to check out that video, that'd be great. And I'll see you in the next one.